so the next aspect I want to talk about is just lenses. Um, and that way you can understand what lenses are. Like if you're going to try to pick out a lens for astrophotography, but you still want to use that lens for regular stuff, there's a lot of choices that you can come into with that. And so if we go back to the start of the cameras, these kind of cameras, you only get one lens. It might have a little bit of zoom, but that's all you're ever going to get with those. So if this is the route you go, then be sure that you know that you're only getting a specific type of lens with that one. But if you get into the mirrorless uh, SLR type uh, cameras and stuff like this, you can get into a bunch of different types of lenses. And so there's a few numbers on here that we need to take into account when we're talking about them. And we can grab a lens just to show that to you. So this has bigger letters on it, so we'll use this one. So this is a 600 millimeter focal length uh, lens. So there's a few numbers on here. One, the 600 millimeter basically is the focal length from the front, uh, front lens element to the back of the lens element. And for this one, to get to the 600 millimeters, you actually have to zoom out. And so that gives you the proper distance from here to there where the camera would be sitting for 600 millimeters. This is a zoom lens, which means you can zoom from 150 to 600. So 150 millimeter focal length, 600 millimeter focal length. And basically what you're doing is changing the ratio of the distance from here to these lens elements that exist over here. So this has several sets of lens elements inside of here. So this one changes it from here to here. And basically what's happening is these front lens elements are creating a light cone that's coming back over here. And depending on where that light cone actually exists, will give you a different magnification or interaction from these lenses over here. So right here, you're getting uh, the full, basically 90 millimeter cone of light coming down and it's kind of shrinking down this way. And then these lenses are picking it up and shooting them out this way. So you're basically getting the full aperture um, or the, yeah, basically the full aperture of the light from here and the full uh, field of view from these front lens elements passing through here. But when you zoom in, what you're doing is the light cone has more time to converge as it gets to these. And so as you're converging, that magnification changes. You're also changing a little bit about how much field of view you're getting. And you're compressing that through here. And then these back lens elements pick that up and send it back to the camera here. So that's how these kind of work. So that's what these numbers on here, the larger numbers, the uh, 150 to 600 or 14 millimeter, you know, that's the, your focal length from your front lens element to your camera. And that's what that is meaning. So there's other ones on here. And where does that exist? So right down here, you see this little uh, circle with a slash on it. Focus on that. So you'll see that right there. So the 95 is this front lens element, the diameter of this front lens element from one side to the other. And so that has, so that has a huge aspect about what, or a huge importance about what everything that is going on back here. Because the larger this is, just like in telescopes, the larger this is, the more light it's getting, which means you're gonna have a brighter image back here. So if this was a 600 millimeter uh, camera lens, which is possible, and this was only like a 50 millimeter opening, the amount of light that you're actually getting back here is going to be significantly smaller than if this was bigger. And that's why if you look at other 600 millimeter lenses um, that have a faster F ratio, this is going to be a lot larger. You're going to have like 100 to 115 millimeter front lens elements to get that faster F ratio. So that's the next thing we're going to talk about is F ratios. And so um, that is basically the ratio between the front lens element and the length or the focal length. So the length from here to here. And so this one, you see this number right here, 5 to 6.3. So five to 6.3, that's your F ratio. And some camera, camera lenses can change that without, without causing those to, well, some 
lenses can change the focal length while not changing that. And that's a little bit more complex light gathering process that's going on in here than what I described earlier, but it's also a much more expensive light gathering process. Um, I won't necessarily go into that because it's a little bit more complicated. Comp it's a little bit more complicated, so we won't go into that. But basically, what it's doing is at 150 milli millimeters, you're at an F ratio of five. That means the ratio between the size here and here is five. And then as you zoom in, unlock that. And as you zoom into 600, the ratio from here to this length is 6.3. And basically what that is saying is the amount of light that is coming through here, passing through here, and landing on your sensor is decreasing. So your brightness that you're seeing over here, the amount of light that's spread over this aperture back here, is decreasing as you're zooming onto that higher level. And so if you can get that number, the five, or 6.3 down lower, that means this is either going to get bigger or this is going to get smaller relative to each other. And you're going to have more of the light from this passing onto your sensor chip. One other way that you can change the aperture is by actually changing the movable aperture that exists inside of the lens. And so what happens with that is um, there's a small bladed aperture that closes um, and you can change that from anywhere between you know the highest apertures which are you know around one and they can go all the way up to like 32 on some lenses and basically that means that the little enclosed or that means that the little aperture that's built inside that can open and close um, can close from a very very small circle which would be the higher numbers um, all the way up to a full aperture opening which is about the equivalent to the front lens element and so there's a lot of things that change with that um, and that's going to change your depth of field and sometimes it can change your sharpness uh, some lenses have better sharpnesses at certain apertures uh, aperture values and so this is something that you can do to either make less light come onto your uh, camera that way you can do much longer exposures in bright daylight um, you can uh, if it's really really bright outside that's also what you want to do um, and then you open it up when you want to take pictures that are really really fast uh, like if somebody's running past you or you know in nighttime photos you want to go uh, wide open like that also okay so there's a another point about the focal ratio that I can kind of show to you and that's basically if you look at two different lenses so these are both lenses for this APS size mirrorless camera and this one goes from 15 to 45 millimeters and has a focal ratio of 3.5 to 6.3 so while it's at 15 millimeters it has an f ratio of uh, 3.5 and as you go to 45 that goes down to 6.3 this other lens over here is a 16 millimeter and it's an f 1.4 so if I set this to about 16 millimeters it's going to have a focal ratio of you know about 3.5 and that means both of these have the same focal length at this point but you notice that the aperture in the front is much larger on this one and that's where that extra light or that extra um, focal ratio comes in. So this one's going to provide a brighter image at the sensor than this one would. And that's because it's actually gathering more light over this aperture right here, meaning it's bringing in more light to actually put on your sensor. And if you get really close, you can actually see that, you know, they're quite a bit different in the amount of light that they'll actually have. Um, let's see. So this one has a full aperture from this side to that side of 49 millimeters. That is actually smaller for there to there. This one is 67 millimeters from there to there, but the aperture is probably right there. So it's more probably like a, a 50 right here, and this one's probably more like a 35. And so that, that big difference right there gives you a big difference of how bright the image will appear on there. And so that is kind of something you need to think about when you're looking at these lenses. 
And what you could do is get a lens that's designed similarly for this, like this, have that same aperture that you have there, and design the lens to put that light down into a smaller chip, and your f ratio would actually go down to match this other one. So if so if you had this aperture onto a much smaller chip, all the light is going down there onto the thing, but you're going to be getting like a probably an f2. But this aperture didn't change. So why is that so much faster? And that's something that a lot of people kind of like don't realize is it's the aperture right here that is gathering the amount of light and it's how that lens is putting all of that light onto your sensor. So that's why when you look at cell phones that have like these little tiny tiny sensors and these little tiny tiny lenses and they're still like an f1.5 that's not gathering a lot of light but it's still an f.5 but that doesn't mean it's gathering any more light. So the f ratio on here isn't a tell of how much light gathering ability the lens actually has. It is actually more telling about how that light is being thrown onto your sensor. And so that's something you need to realize um, a little bit sooner than later. That way you don't go out and buy like, you know, some f2 lens that has this little tiny thing, but you would need to put on a little tiny camera in order to get it like that. So think about that. And that's the same with telescopes. Um, we have a lot of telescopes these days that are coming out with really fast lenses and stuff like Rasa's and you can get tele adapters and stuff like that, that put that light onto a smaller area chip. And so let's say you had a 14 inch telescope and you put a telecompressor slash focal length reducer on there and you were starting off with a 35 millimeter that focal reducer is actually going to create a smaller image circle on your chip to create that brighter brightness over that area. So you're actually going to be losing a lot of light around the peripheral of your image. And so those some of those are actually designed for APS size chips or even smaller depending on how fast they go down. And if you look at some Rasas, like the Celestron Rasa, those some of those like the 8 inch are designed for an APS size sensor and some of them are designed for a 35 millimeter sensor that would be on like the 11 inch and you also notice that the cameras are being put on the front and so it's kind of the same thing that's going on with this so let's say you start off at 600 millimeters all the way over here the light that's coming through has a smaller or a longer path to converge those light rays down into the area down here that spreads it out this way. Okay, when you, if you were to have this as a Rasa, instead of having your camera at the back, it would be at the front, and you're actually cutting down the the amount of focal length, so you're actually kind of de-zooming that telescope, that telescope, so the light path that's coming through here to your camera that's you know on the front I'm gonna it's gonna be kind of confusing but the light path is actually being um, picked up before it's converged to a point and so um, you're gathering more of that light over a certain amount of area before it has a point to converge and so you can play with the optics and stuff like that to get your uh, faster telescope but you know you're not with those telescopes you're not gathering any more light than you would be if you had it on the back of the telescope your aperture stays the same it's just when you're picking off that light and where your image sensor is actually um, gathering all of that light and so yeah there's a little bit of optical play that comes into play with that or comes into place with that um, about where it's being picked off um, at what point in the image circle is being picked off, how big that image circle has been designed um, for those particular points. Uh, but, you know, you're just, you're not gathering any more light, you're just gathering it over a different amount of area. And so um, it's not really a trick and it's not really a lie, but it's just a, not a complete understanding of what's going on for most people. So keep that in mind when you're, when you're looking at these things and talking about them. And you, if you're looking at 
focal reducers and stuff for telescopes with your cameras, you want to make sure that your focal reducer isn't reducing it be like below the point of your um, your image size. That way you're using your image, uh, your sensor to its full capacity. Or go off and get um, a camera or a dedicated astral camera that has the proper sensor size for the image circle that you plan on having. So there's a lot of different things that come into play with that. And it's going to be a little bit difficult getting this kind of straightened out in your brain. But once you figure it out, you're going to be like, ah, now I know exactly what to get and how it works. So I hope you can understand that. Um, if I didn't explain it too well, sorry, but it's not the easiest thing to do without having to go through mathematical models and drawings and diagrams and stuff to show you exactly how it's working. So uh, hope it's all right. I hope it's good enough. Does that work? <laughs> Okay, so there's a lot of other aspects about lenses that we want to go into, and you might hear these things called APO lenses or apochromatic lenses. And basically, what that's what's that tell what that is telling you is that the some of the lenses that you have on here have been designed with either different types of glass or in different series in order to reduce what's called chromatic aberration. And chromatic aberration is when different wavelengths of light do not come into the same focal point as other wavelengths of light. So red, green, and blue all we don't go through materials at the same um, angles, basically. So they, they diffract or refract. They refract at different angles depending on the wavelength. And so you have to design a lens with different lens types of elements and different types of glass in order to account for those differences in uh, refraction. And so it's a little bit of a difficult play to do that. That's why they're always more expensive. Um, APO telescopes are, you know, anywhere between two to five or six times more expensive for going from a regular refracting telescope to an apochromatic telescope. But the amount of sharpness and the color corrections that you get on it are a lot better. And so if you're reading like photography blogs and stuff like that, and you're um, hearing things about CA, just the letters CA, that's chromatic aberration. And so that is basically how well the um, camera or the lens company was able to account for the differences in uh, light being diffract or being refracted at different angles at different wavelengths. So it's kind of a mouthful to say that, so sorry. Um, so that's something to take into account. So something with better chromatic aberration control will always be a little bit more expensive. And sometimes you'll hear about different types of lens elements or different types of glass being used in your lenses or telescopes. And that's kind of what they're talking about. Um, some camera lenses have a lot more what are called lens elements so like this one would have something like 12 different lens elements so that's basically how many of these lenses are in there bouncing the light around and bending it and everything in there to get it to the outside um, some lenses have you know like five or six lens elements and they're pretty basic those ones are going to be more like what are called fixed focal length lenses, which means they're non-zooming lenses. So they actually can have fewer lens elements, but you can make them to a higher quality and you'll actually get better overall images with those. Um, but if you look at a zoom lens, it's going to have, you know, you know, 15 up to 20 different lens elements inside of these to be able to control the light all, all the way down. And so you got to take that into account when you're thinking about how much this weighs. You know, this is a few pounds right here as opposed to like this one right here, which is, you know, probably three quarters of a pound, you know, not very heavy at all. Um, but when you're trying to hold one of these bigger lenses up and trying to take pictures of stuff in the sky or hold it still in order to get pictures, you know, this extra weight's going to kind of make you shake a little bit more than normal. Um, so keep that in, in mind. So uh, there's lenses that come standard without an autofocus on there, like this one right here. This is a Rockinon. Uh, 10 millimeter to f2.8. This is a fixed focal length, but also a non 
autofocus. So it's a manual focus lens, um, which means you'll be doing the focusing right here all of the time um, to try to get your images in focus. And that's not a bad thing. Um, autofocus makes things a lot easier, especially when you're doing like uh, images of things that are moving quickly, um, things that are just moving, it makes it a lot easier uh, overall. And, you know, just sometimes you have kind of a hard time focusing just with your eye because your eye, you kind of adjust your focus of your eye a little bit when you're looking through things. And it kind of defocuses this, although it'll look focused in your eyeball, you have to kind of relax your eye and focus with your telescope or your camera. That way you get the actual focus that's coming to the focal plane of your camera because you can focus your eye just a little bit. You can do it like sitting here watching me do this. You can actually focus your eye in and out um, if you have that you know kind of eye control like some people have. But that little bit of focus can actually change how much you're focusing in here and you might actually never get good focused images doing manual. And so that's where autofocus helps because it's the focal plane that is focusing is based off of is at the focal plane of the camera. And so it's going to be pretty close within, you know, a little bit of shifting some non uh, camera specific lenses. So, you know, like instead of going with a Canon lens, you use a Tamron or a Sigma. Sometimes they won't be quite as precise at focusing um, as like a Canon dedicated to a camera or to a Canon or a Nikon dedicated to a Nikon, just because there's a little bit of um, leeway in the design of the optics and how the camera actually deals with the optics. And so um, it's it's kind of a minor thing for some people. It's kind of a major thing for others, but it's something to take into account when you're focusing and focusing especially manually. Um, so that's kind of the thing is just like how, which way is more comfortable, comfortable with you. Uh, manual focusing lenses are a lot cheaper because they don't have that focusing mechanism and the electronics built into them. Um, but you know, they're not always as useful for regular daytime shooting. Um, and you know, sometimes, like I was saying, some people don't really have the best focusing abilities for manual, um, as some other people do. So, you know, it's just, that'll be completely up to you whether or not you want to go with one or the other. Um, you can get that Nikon or that Rokinon with autofocusing capability, um, and it's going to be similar in speed and stuff, but I think it's about two or three hundred dollars more. Uh, don't quote me on that, because uh, I don't carry the numbers. You want to look that up if you want to know about it. So just keep that in mind. Um, there's also things called vibration reduction or optical image stabilization or, you know, some other thing. Um, each telescope or I'm sorry, um, each camera company and each lens company will have like a different name for that. So some of them are IS, some are OS. Uh, what is this one? This one's an OS. Um, and so basically what it's doing is there's a lens element with little motors attached to it inside the lens. And based on how it's detecting you wiggling around, it will actually move those little, uh, that little lens back and forth in there to counteract the movement of your, uh, your camera or your lens. And it kind of helps to bring all the light back into the center of your, uh, in, into, into your camera. And so, um, it can, drastically help uh, the sta stability and sharpness of your images, um, depending on if it's working right and how much you're actually shaking and stuff. So some camera companies have that in their lenses. Some camera companies have that built into their camera body. Uh, if you have them, if you don't have one built into your camera, you have to get lenses that have it built in but if you have it in your camera, you can use any lens and it'll give you that image stabilization built into it. So that's a really good thing with that. And some newer cameras these days can use both of them at the same time to kind of maximize that and bring up the uh, stability even better. So that's something to look at with those. But when you're, look, when you're doing astrophotography, you actually won't be using those um, because that little motor, if you're holding still and having stuff move across your frame or having stuff move through it or if you're even taking a still frame uh, 
the problems with that comes in that it'll try to correct for things that don't exist and it can actually make your image worse and so you don't want to use that when doing astrophotography or still photography and stuff like that so it's not always a good thing so there's one other type of lens we talked about zoom versus fixed lenses a little bit um, basically all it all it is again is a fixed lens you can't zoom in at all it has a little bit better sharpness sometimes a lot better sharpness they're a little bit lighter they're often a lot faster and they're you know oftentimes a little bit easier to use and a little bit more rugged um, but with zoom lenses you don't have to buy six or whatever different lenses you know like if you're just if you just use prime lenses that's their normal uh, normal term for them is prime lens um, you have to buy like a wide angle uh, mid zoom and a long telephoto or something if you're going to plan on being you know whatever and taking images of several different types of things whereas with a zoom lens you can kind of get all of those focal lengths built into one lens so overall it's a lot cheaper but it doesn't always give you the best and sharpest results but not everybody is about that you know you can get pretty decent quality images pretty um, decent uh, focused images and stuff off of a zoom lens um, but there are some people out there that do this as a living and they want as sharp as possible so they'll be using prime lenses instead of uh, zoom lenses so that's one of the things um, but there's one other type of lens and that's called a macro lens um, I have a pseudo macro so this is a, a zoom lens with a macro function built in and basically a macro lens is a lens that can focus two objects that are really really close to the lens itself um, this lens only does macro between two and three hundred millimeters you can switch right here and you know if you go to three hundred millimeters normally that's as far out as it goes but when you zoom in it moves that front lens element even farther up that way you can focus in on things that are a decent far away but are still too close than you would be able to with normal focusing so it just adds a little bit of functionality in there so if you're taking pictures of bugs or flowers or something you can get a little bit closer a true macro though isn't something like this it's something that has the ability to focus something that's really close to the lens itself and so these ones all of these lenses i've talked about so far have a minimum focusing distance and sometimes it's you know within a foot to two or three feet depending on the focal length of the camera or the of the focal length of the um, lens but macro lenses you should be able to get you know really really close up to it depending on which focal length macro you're using it will give you a different you know kind of close focusing distance with there but it actually magnifies the images of the flowers or bugs or whatever by you know a really good amount and so you can get like really fine detail and like really small things so they're really cool um, I really like these kinds that are like this because they're not super expensive but you still kind of get that function so you know it's something to think about if you're you know wanting to go from astronomy down into the bug world and you know stuff like that so it's an option so another thing that you might hear a lot of in astronomy or or photography are rules but anytime somebody tells you there's a rule uh, it always means it's a guideline or not really a rule at all and so it's kind of like the best idea of how to think about something really and so there's like the two-thirds rule like you should have your image a little you know balanced from two-thirds from the bottom or two-thirds from the right or to the left depending on which culture you're part of um, so it's kind of like a guideline based off of how things you want things to appear but sometimes going away from that rule is actually a pretty cool thing and you come up with these really kind of somewhat abstract ideas of stuff um, and then there's like the focal length rule when you're doing wide angle Milky Way photography so depending on your focal length and the uh, your exposure length um, you're supposed to be able to tell how far something will move or you're supposed to be able to tell or it's supposed to tell you how far something won't move given a certain amount of time and then you can base your exposures off of that kind of a focal length time and then if you want to change your ISO and stuff like that to counteract that you know that's kind of something to follow but it's not a strict rule 
it just gives you a guideline to follow to kind of like give you an idea of what to do, uh, especially when you're starting out. But, you know, after about three or four times, all of these rules kind of become like second thoughts or even like afterthoughts of stuff. And it will kind of give you a little bit more freedom to learn them and then kind of unlearn them. So there's a lot of different things with that. So when everybody's, whenever somebody tells you there's a rule in photography, you should be like, okay, cool, I'll look into it and kind of get the idea and then use it as best as you want or as much as you want. There are really no rules in art. There are opinions. Yeah. <laughs>